I am talking about the design and development of heterogeneous catalyst for sustainable chemical industry and the reactions are known, the products are known and how we design the catalyst and how we do the reaction is important. And greetings from IHTT Mumbai, so where I am a BP Godrej professor as already Professor Paul told you. And also this is Institute of Chemical Technology, this is a deemed university and also we have the strive to be vibrant institute and also we shall be creators of sprouting knowledge and design cutting edge technologies that have the great impact on society and also the benefit of the mankind at large. And coming to that I spent 32 years at ICT, IICT. Hyderabad, it is a CSR institute and whatever I did is all from IICT and then it's a great institute and uh, it was uh, initiated in 1944 and it an institute dedicated to serve the nation in the area of uh, chemical sciences and technology. Then uh, in 2015 I moved to ICT Mumbai. And also when I talk about anything, I will start with the Professor Mahatma Gandhi's words, there is enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for anyone's greed. And also we have to think about the sustainable development and the chemists have a play a major role in the developing the sustainable chemical industry. And then again, coming to that Abdul Kalam words, this is the technology unlike science is a group activity it is not based on individual in intelligence, but on the interacting intelligence of many. So if you want to develop a technology, you need chemical engineers and you need analytical chemists, you need the mechanical engineers and analytical, everybody you need, otherwise you can't develop a technology. So because why I am telling you, because I will tell about the technologies which we have developed in the last. So it is very important that is a group work. It is not an intelligence of any individual. And coming to that, you can see the world chemical market and you can see the world chemical market and you, this is the world turnover is US dollars 4.1 trillion and it is in 5.1 trillion in 2022. And when you see this, you can see the base chemicals are 45 percent and base chemicals you can see the petrochemical fertilizers and other organic, inorganic chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And you can see the pharmaceuticals 25 percent and specialty chemicals are 22 percent which comes to pigments, leather chemicals, construction chemicals and agrochemicals like that you can see the division of the chemicals, base chemicals, pharmaceuticals and specialty chemicals and agrochemicals. And when coming to that Indian chemical industry, you can see the Indian chemical industry, the basic chemicals is 63 percent and pharmaceuticals are 24 percent and the specialty is 18 percent agrochemicals. And you can see the size of the chemical industry is US dollars 108.4 billion dollars and expected to reach 304 billion in 2024 and 25. You can see the importance of the chemical industry, Indian chemical industry. And also it is the sixth largest in the world and also fourth largest in the Asia and it accounts for more than 3 percent of the global chemical industry. So we are very good in making the chemicals and uh, you can see the petrochemical industry is one of the top industries in Asia and you can see the reliance and all uh, petrochemical industry. And uh, why this catalysis is important? You can see the catalysis research for 21st century. You can see that there are catalysts by design. I told that reactions are known, products are known, how you design the catalyst is important. And you can see the organocatalysis. And again, you can see the heterogeneous catalysis and inorganic catalyst and uh, catalytic reactions or engineering is important. And there are different techno techniques for the characterization of the techniques and you can see that you can make the any catalyst. And also the, you can see the strategic goal for human welfare and humanity's top 10 problems. You can see energy, water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism and war, disease, education and democracy and population. And you can see the important in energy, yes, catalysis is important and food, environment,
environment disease you can see these are the very important and the world today by the concept of sustainability through innovation and catalysis is one of the major force to the economy and also you can ask the chemical industry depends on the catalyst and we depend on the our life for the chemical industry and you can see 90% of the process in the chemical industry are uses the catalyst and the catalyst sales you can see 16.5 billion dollars and the growth in catalyst sales increases 5 to 10% per year and what is the key characteristics of the catalyst when you are developing a material you should see the characteristics of the materials what are that one and you can see it should be active good activity and also high selectivity and long operating life because when you are putting in the alkylation anything in petrochemical industry you should see the long life it was years together you don't have to remove it and also compatibility with the process and robustness and the another important is the low cost if it is an expensive catalyst then the process becomes very expensive so you should see that your catalyst is very cheap and coming to that one what is the ideal synthesis for example you want to follow the green chemistry and green principle what is the ideal synthesis is it should be atom efficient safe simple and 100% yield and no wasted reagents and available materials and you have to see that it should be environmentally acceptable and the fundamental catalytic principles you can see surface area pore structure pore density are important and you see the chemical properties oxidation state acidity and surface composition for example some reactions you know the bronfield basic sites and some reactions you know the lewis acidity so it depends upon how you have defined your catalyst and also you can see the catalytic properties activity and selectivity and also you can measure the efficiency of the chemical reactions by the reaction yield yield is the quantity of the products obtained theoretical maximum quantity of products and selectivity so the important in any process is the e factor that is the total quantity of the waste and the quantity of the products obtained so when you go for the e factor you can see oil refinery it is the product tonnage is 10 to 6 to 10 to the 8 and the e factor is it is 0.1 so they are very good thing and the e factor is they, they are very effective and you go for bulk chemicals and fine chemicals personal pharmaceuticals you can see the product tonnage is low but the e factor increases because they use many reagents and is a number of steps in involved so the e factor increases so you have to see when you are design a process the e factor should be less then it will be a good process and coming to that you, you can see the chemistry is everywhere you can see what is the important of the chemistry you can see chemistry for health care you want to ask for drugs yes chemist can do it cancer and c covid remedies way who made the chemist only made this catalyst so without the help of engineers they cannot make so that's why it is all important that is a group work together and again infections alzheimer aspirin aids insulin diabetes quinine fluorosis you can see the without chemistry you cannot make any of this thing and again i am coming to that one catalysis and nobel prize is source of inspiration and you can see in 2010 and richard heck negishi and suzuki got the cc coupling reactions and they got the nobel prize what is important is this is the palladium catalyzed cross coupling and it is used worldwide and the commercial production for the example in the pharmaceuticals and molecules used for the electronic industry so this is the cc coupling is very important and usually you can see what are the important you can see the pesticide herbicide prosulfuron anti asthma drug and you can see the what is the important of the cc coupling and you can see that any anti cancer drug without this hec reaction you cannot do and rilpinavir which is used for hiv infection though this coupling reaction is very important and you go for anti inflammatory drug naproxen yes cc coupling is very important and when you go for this sunscreen agents again cc coupling reaction is very important so usually the cc coupling reaction is done by using the phosgene and this is you can see palladium chloride and triphenyl phosgene when you want to activate the bromoin iodo compounds it's very easy when you activate the fluoro compounds it's very difficult you need a special phosgene 
which is highly moist and healthy. So these are the phosphokinase, the Herman reads, and these are the phosphines you have to develop for the CC coupling reaction to make the silvin derivative. And what we have done is we have taken simply hydrotalcide, that is magnesium aluminum mixture oxide, which you can make it very easily. You can see M2, M3, there are the anions in this one. And you can see you can make easily by treating the magnesium oxide, aluminum nitrate, you can make the pH, you can make the layer double hydroxide, that is hydrotalcide. And again, you can see this is a chloride is there. And you can replace the tetrachloropalladate and you will get the palladium on the hydrotalcid. And if you can reduce the hydrogen hydrate, you will reduce the palladium 2 into palladium 0. That is the, you can make this one. Why you have selected hydrotalcid? Because you can see the phosphines are basic, these hydrotalcids are basic. So we have selected a support, which is a basic support. So we put palladium on it and palladium 0. And we have completely characterized the catalyst stem, XPL spectra, to show that palladium is in the zero state. And then you can see same reaction. I told you earlier the activation of the chloro compound is very difficult. So we have activated the chloro compound. You get the silvin derivatives using the catalyst. And we have published in JAT. And you can see the same thing. Suzuki coupling reaction is also very important. When you take any chloro compound and then you react with boronic acid, you will get that again biphenyl derivatives, which is very uh, important. Why it is important? You can see the fungicides and also you can see the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis without Suzuki coupling, you cannot get these reactions. And also these are, you can see, this is already BP drugs. Uh, all these uh, sartan derivatives, losartan, candesartan, irbisartan, anything you can take, you cannot make with this uh, without the Suzuki reaction. And uh, similarly, the same catalyst, you can see the palladium on hydrotalcid, it works for this reaction. And the important is it works at room temperature and it in 12 hours it gives the biphenyl derivatives. And you can see it can also do the Stille coupling, Swanagishra coupling, any type of reaction you can do it with this simple catalyst. And next coming to the CN bond formation and you can see the CN bond formation is very important. Any drug molecule you want to make is this reaction is important. Here again, what we have taken, we have taken another catalyst. This is hydroxyapatite, which is very easy to make. And you can make this calcium nitrate and ammonium hydrogen phosphate. You make the calcium hydroxy phosphate. And you want to increase the basicity, you can react with chloride. And or you can tercibutoxide, you make the calcium chlorohepatite or tercibutoxyapatite. And again, you can introduce a metal by impregnation, you will get the calcium or copper chloroapatite. And why these are also very important catalysts, because you can see this catalyst and you can see the aeration of imidazole you can do with the chloroapatite catalyst. Same, the simple principle is uh, this one hydroxyapatite is basic and you put your metal, you can do the reaction and you can make the any type of imidazole using your catalyst. And the advantage is these catalysts are, <coughs> you can use it, reuse it, and they are heterogeneous catalysts. And again, you can see there are, again, any annihilation of amines, imidazoles, anything you can do with the hydroxyapatite catalyst. And similarly, we have done recently cinnamyl pyrrole to cinnamyl nitrile using the palladium chloroapatite catalyst. And here you can make it the cinnamyl pyrrole, you can make in the lab, and you react with the estonitrile with your palladium chloroapatite catalyst, you make the cinnamon nitrile. And these are the, and again, you can see this is a simple biocompatible support. It is a hydrotalcid, it is a hydroxyapatite. You can put the different metal, you can do the osteum, and then you can do the hydroxylation reaction, and you can do the hydrocylylation, any base, silman, any reaction. So I told you that uh, the product is known and the reaction is known. How you design a catalyst and how you will use for a reaction is important. So we have taken this uh, appetite and hydroxyapatite and we did the number of reaction. And similarly, we have a collaboration with Professor Clavande in Kansas State University and he is making the nanomagnesium oxide and using for the destruction of the other war chemicals. So he wanted to 
take these materials and use for the reaction. And we have taken this material, and you can see this uh, nanomagnesium oxide. It consists of the Bronsted basic sites as well as the Lewis acid sites, and also O2 minus and Lewis acidic sites. OH is the Bronsted basic site, and you can see the Mg2H Lewis acidic sites. So it is what is important is how you use your material for a different reaction is important. So what we have done is you can see this the reaction is a base catalyzed reaction and we took this nanomagnesium oxide and we did the Clausen-Schmidt condensation and you will get the charge bonds very easily because the, all the charge bonds are very important products in pharmaceutical. And you can see when you use the nanomagnesium oxide, the reaction 97% yield in 12 hours, whereas the commercial magnesium oxide, you can see 84% and 50 hours. And you can see this is the number of the different uh, aldehydes we took and different types of charge bonds we made. And I told you that uh, you can see this one, we don't know that OH is uh, also good or this other o minus, O2 minus is important. So what we did is, we did the reaction like this, 97% and 12 hours. Then what we did is we cellulited the OH group and we did the reaction in, uh, the, and it takes uh, 20 hours. That means the Lewis uh, and uh, the Bronsted basic sites, both are important for this reaction. And again, you can see this one, again, the magnesium oxide can also be used as a support. And same like that, we put the palladium on hydrotalcite, we put this one and palladium chloride, and then we reduced and you will get the palladium zero on the magnesium, this one, magnesium oxide. And the, diff and the important is you can do the any type of reaction. The important reaction, what we did is, you can see the, you, this one nitro reduction is very important reaction. If you want to make the para aminophenol, it is very important. And you can see this uh, catalyst, just hydrogen balloon, and uh, in the room temperature, you can do the reaction of the nitro compounds with this one. And you can see this one, this is the reaction that eight is uh, nitro phenol, and you can reduce the, to para aminophenol, which is very important, which is goes for the para esquimol preparation. So these are the catalysts which are very important. And you can see the simple nanomagnesium oxide, you can do Wittig reaction, Wadsworth reaction, any type of reaction, because the basic characteristics are very important. You can do the different type of reaction. And also when we went for the conversion of the biomass, now everybody works on the biomass, biomass to making the fuel, or biomass to chemicals is very important. And you can see this one, we have done the hydrogenation of luvulinic acid into valrolactone using our catalyst. And you can see the luvulinic acid is one of the 12 most important chemicals of the molecule. And you can make the luvulinic acid to valrolactone. First, you do the hydrogenation and do the dehydration. You make the valrolactone. It is a potential green solvent and fuel. So what we did is, again, we make the copper-based heterogeneous catalysts are very well known. And you can see the copper zirconia and copper chromium and copper iron. But the reactions are going at high temperatures and high pressures. So we again, we made the copper, nickel, magnesium, aluminum catalyst, mixed metal oxide catalyst. And we did the reaction. You can see the reaction we did at 140 and 30 bar pressure. And you will get the conversion 100%. 100 selectivity, and you can see the introduction of a Lewis base, MgO, along with the copper nickel may promote the hydrogenation under mild reaction. And it is easy to prepare. I already told you, take a metal precursors and flow precipitation. You make the pH 9 and a layer double hydroxide calcination and oxide phase. And you can see the, we have completely characterized this catalyst. You can see the, because when the first you see the, magnesium aluminate and magnesium oxide, nickel oxide. When you reduce it, you will get the magnesium and the nickel copper alloy, which is very good. And you can see the copper nickel alloy formation is suppressed leaching and stability during the recycling. And also we do the XPS analysis to show that the oxidation state of the metal, you can see the copper is copper two plus oxidation and nickel also exists in nickel zero 
and nickel oxide and completely characterize all the catalyst and we need the reaction. And similarly, you can also do the limonenic acid to valrolactone, another catalyst we did, nickel supported or organoclay catalyst also we did. And you can see the, again, we have completely characterized the catalyst and we did the reaction and you can see the, it why this one is, uh, this shows the mesoporous structure of clay, encourages good dispersion of the nickel catalyst particles and which is very good. And also we can show we effect of temperature solvents we did and then we have did the reaction. And also we did the catalyst reusability and because the, some of the processes we have taken patent and then we are going to commercialize some of them soon. And also you can see again this one is a very important reaction because everybody knows you to, <coughs> you can replace this one with the dimethyl furan dicarboxylic acid you can make and instead of furan dicarboxylic acid you can make the furan dimethyl carboxylate and then you can make it uh, you treat with the ethylene glycol you will get the PEF polyethylene furanate which is used for the making these all plastic bottles which are very susceptible and you can make them and here what we did is we have you can see this one Again, we want to make the PEF bottle and you want to make this reaction to make the furan dimethyl carboxylate. You want to make this one oxygen and methanol and with hydroxymethyl perfurol. And what we did is we have taken the tertiary butyl hydrogen peroxide and with our catalyst, which can be acting as a methyl hesitin as well as a oxidizing agent. So you can make this one very easily. You can take the fluoronic P23 and react with the ethanol nitric acid. You will get the, you can see the mesoporous aluminia embedded with the copper oxide nanoparticles. You can make and you react with copper nitrate, aluminum isopropoxide, gel composite calcination, and you will get the mesoporous aluminia with the copper oxide nanoparticles. And this one also we have completely characterized. You can see all the catalysts are very well characterized. And you can increase the copper percentage. And you can see 8%, 6% copper. And you will get the FDMC. And that is the furan dimethyl carboxylic acid in very good yield. And you can also the methyl acidification of various biomass derived derivatives also you can do. And some of the process we are going to commercialize. And again, perfural to perfural alcohol is also very good reaction. And this is also we are commercializing for Godavari biorefineries. And you can see this is a, just you take the bentonite catalyst and you will put your nickel on it and you can do the reaction. And because the important is the reactions earlier, they are at high temperatures and high pressures. Here you can do it, the reactions at uh, 150 degrees and also 20 bar pressure you can do. And this is also, we have catalyst reusability time study, the perfural to perfural alcohol we did. And then finally, coming to the technologies, and here this is the technologies when we have developed when I was in IACT, I just wanted to show this technology. And here you can see this one is the tertiary butyl toluene. And tertiary butyl toluene is used as a solvent and intermediate for organic synthesis. And then again, if you take this tertiary butyl toluene, you oxidize, you will get the tertiary butyl benzoic acid, which is used as a catalyst. And why we did this one, you can see that it can be converted into tertiary butyl benzoic acid is methyl para tertiary butyl benzoate. And you can do the esterification because these are used for the sunscreen agent. This methyl tertiary butyl benzoate, when it's condensed with the para methoxyestophenone, it will give the evobenzene, which is used as a sunscreen agent. And you can see this one, we did the alkylation of the toluene is isobutylene. We get the para tertiary butyl toluene. And again, we oxidize, we will get the para tertiary butyl benzoic acid. And esterification, you will get the meta para tertiary butyl benzoate. And this one, you can see this, we have done the reaction in the lab scale in IACT in March, because of how much time it takes to commercialize a process, you can see when we have demonstrated on a 
large scale and it is 2013 which is the process developed and exclusively single isomer and you can make the tertiary butyl toluene and then again this tertiary butyl toluene when you do this uh, oxidation you will get and this is also catalyzed by cobalt salt we have developed a process eight as an oxidation and 10 bar pressure 130 and this is also demonstrated on a bench scale at this one and later we went for a pilot plant where making the tertiary butyl toluene and you can see the alkylation at uh, 5 kg per hour continuous mode we have developed an isut pilot plant and you will get the 70 percent conversion with 100 percent selectivity of para tertiary butyl toluene and we have demonstrated the process and you can say one year it took to demonstrate the process on a pilot scale and we have demonstrated in 2014 to Vinati Organic. And again, you can see the demonstrators of the tertiary butyl benzoic acid also we have demonstrated for them. And uh, you can see the February 2014. And again, you can see this one we have already put the commercial plant in 2017 at uh, Lotte with for Vinati Organics. And they are developing 4,000 tons per a year using our process and we have patented everything and we have given the technology to Vinati Organic. And uh, again, this is the, uh, that is the toluene, para tertiary butyl toluene. And you can see this is the para tertiary butyl benzoic acid that also by oxidation, they also put this commercial plant and they are making 3,000 tons per year. And again, when you see this process and when you make a process in the large scale itself, you have to show the industry what are the parameters, what is already existing in the process. And you can see the market specifications of the para tertiary butyl benzoic acid. You can see white crystalline purity, water, and then we have, we, the ISET product met the, all the parameters. And again, when you are giving a process, economics will not work out, nobody will take. So in the large scale itself also, you have to show the economics of the process and you can see the consumption of the process, chemical toluene and isobutylene, catalyst for alkylation, catalyst for the oxidation, and you can see the acetic acid and price of the raw material. You can see the price of the raw material is 94, 94 rupees per a kg of the product. And you can see the price of PTBBA, that is para tertiary butyl benzoic acid in the market is 245 rupees and the extra is 290. And you can see the for one kg is that much and you can see the for 3000 to 4000 tons and so it will be profitable. Once we show them, then only the industry will be ready to go for the commercialization. And it is the intermediate, I told you, the evobenzene. So we have shown and they have commercialized the process. And uh, how much, we, how you will be feel very happy, whatever you develop in the lab goes for a commercialization. Like that, we have developed many technologies because of the lack of the time. I am just showing one of the technology, what we have developed. And we got all the awards, technology awards, everything for this technology when we have given this to industry. So what is the future of the catalysis? You can see the, what is the future of the catalysis is first we do the process intensification and energy savings and economy of the process and also environment. So environment is the most important thing when we develop a, any technology. So the new challenge before chemists and engineers today is develop innovative catalytic processes for utilization of the biomass for fuels. Now everybody, you can see CO2 to methanol, dimethyl ether, any, these are the challenging problems and many we are developing and we are developing on the pilot scale and we are going to commercialize <coughs> very soon. And then you can see the catalytic processes for utilization of the biomass for fuels and chemicals to address the issue of sustainability and the fast dwindling petroleum resources, this is important. So what are the goals and challenges and opportunities and vision and technology targets remains uh, relevant. Selective oxidation, alkane activation, byproduct and waste minimization, stereoselective synthesis, functional olefin polymerization, alkylation, alternative feed stocks and renewables, these are the important. And this is uh, my acknowledgement to ICT Mumbai, Godrej consumer products which has given me professorship 
and IIT Hyderabad, Jesse Bell's Fellowship, RMIT University, Tokyo University, Tejpur University, University of Newcastle. This is the, my present team and we are working in the number of uh, industries to make this uh, sustainable chemical and processing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lakshmi Kantam. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Little bit ahead, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> because you are after me, so I have to do it. <laughs> so, so we have time for questions. Yes. So, for example, oxidation state is very important. Palladium 0 to 2 or nickel, nickel to 2, that is important. So, that's why if there is a transferable oxidation state, it will be very important when we do the bimetallic catching. Because in our case, the copper is very active that way. Yeah, excellent presentations. So I have one question regarding calculation of the the final cost. Right. So is the manpower was calculated in that? Because see, we are doing this one only on the chemical cost. Manpower and other things we can add it, no? Definitely. Without manpower, electricity and other things would work that we cannot do it. That's why we don't do the manpower. They will do it. That is industry business. We will show only what is that our material cost, product cost? Yeah, because why I'm asking because which is already known in the domain. Yeah. So that cost is including all manpower and all. No, no, we don't include that. The industry will calculate the, the cost. Okay, so that difference will come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, madam, uh, I have a question. When do you choose whether to use homogeneous catalysis or heterogeneous catalysis? Yeah, because now everybody wants heterogeneous catalysis and also all the continuous fixed bed reactions, nobody wants to do it in a batch. No? So all the technologies, now we are developing all fixed bed reactions. And the Professor Devang knows much better than me. He's a chemical engineer. So nobody prefers the batch mode process anything now. But for... Uh, Small scale, yes, it is okay. Up to 1,000... Uh, tons, it is okay. But if you want to above 10,000 tons, 3,000 tons, nobody prefers that. How, how about for chiral uh, uh, products? Chiral products, I am not doing. It is very difficult. I did uh, earlier when uh, when I did with uh, the, this one, ready labs and other things I did and uh, this one. Now I don't do chiral products. Thank you. There are uh, so many organic chemists who they can do it. <laughs> For me, the bulk chemicals is important. Any other question? Yeah, Devan. So, uh, you know, is biomass to fuels really practical given the amount of fuel that we need? Uh, what I've heard is that now people are making synthetic fuels starting from this carbon dioxide rather than biomass, because this the availability of biomass uh, but is very limited. Yeah, for example, this you can see velrolaxone, okay? It is not a, a fuel. This is used as a solvent in making the pharmaceutical and other things. So that's why it is very feasible. Even if they don't use as a fuel, but these all products are very well known and they can use it as a different purpose. Thank you. I think in the comment to what Devang asked is very important, but I believe that many portfolios have to be examined again because I don't think that the costing is so clear. Uh, you are right that the biomass is yeah, not yeah. available, but at the same time, CO2 to methanol, for example, by already normal chemical catalysis is quite expensive still. No, no, already hydrogen. we have developed and Professor Yadav is going to put a final plan. With the water, water. CO2 to with methanol the water. and DME. Yeah. yeah, with water, not yeah. raw hydrogen. Yeah. Raw hydrogen is very, very expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Electrolysis and then yeah. splitting, water splitting, hydrogen. Yeah, and right, right. Both together. Yeah, we are putting. So there are so many things, I, and then costing, you know, which will eventually work out. Is a, it's a very big uh, area, I think, this yeah. entire fuel area. Otherwise, nobody will take. It will be just publication. Funding. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> If there are no more questions, then let me thank Professor Lakshmikantham for a wonderful talk on the area of catalysis. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, she, she is a very good friend of mine, and we had great overlaps uh, uh, between us when we were fellow directors in CSI labs at the same time, NCL and ISCT. So uh, this is very relevant because the next speaker who is coming now, Professor Jain Murthy, is also a fellow director of the ISER when I went to ISER system. So I overlapped with him, so it was a very interesting uh, uh, mix of the speakers that I see. Uh, 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 thank you, Professor Lakshmi Kantham, for an excellent talk, yeah. Uh, so I, before I invite Professor Jain Murthy, I would like to say that Jain Murthy, of course, currently is a director of uh, ISAR Tiruvananthapuram, and he obtained his PhD from the Organic Chemistry Department of ISC Bangalore, and then he did his postdoc in Germany, Canada, as well as in the US, in several departments. Uh, many probably would not know that he was, uh, for a brief period, in the chemistry department of IIT Kharagpur, uh, before he joined, actually, IIT Kanpur. So, of course, he, he is a professor of IIT Kanpur, and in April 2019, he moved from IIT Kanpur to ISA Trivandrum. He is a recipient of AVS postdoctoral fellowship, Santi Saru Bhatnagar Award, medals of CRSI. Uh, he is also Sastra CNR Rao Awardee and fellow of the International Science Academy, Indian Academy of Science, and now JC Bose Fellow. So he, he works in the area of supramolecular chemistry, organic materials. So I think he's going to talk about functional materials today, how to build from the bottom up approach, molecules to materials. you can start. I would like to thank at the outset the council members for this wonderful opportunity. In fact, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Lakshmi Kantham for giving me that extra bit. I think there are a few niggles here. I suppose <laughs> we prevail over. Uh, that will be inconvenient for me. No, it doesn't work at all? No. Oh, it works. Yeah, That's good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ate. I must say that, you know, she has already set a uh, stage for me to carry forward. Unlike her, I work completely in an academic setup, and my research, research is completely academic in nature. I gave this title, Molecules to Materials, Hopefully, uh, with the expectation that, you know, I'll try to, I'll impress upon you as to how an organic chemist deals with molecules when looking at the properties, right? And if we talk about any material, particularly organic materials, you have a variety of them that we witness in, in every walk of our life. Starting from organic light emitting diodes that we're used to today, without which we, we simply cannot exist, the gadgets to polymers of all kinds, starting from insulators to conducting polymers to any kind, catalytic materials that, that she gave a beautiful uh, talk about, without which the industry cannot, cannot exist, materials for, materials for imaging uh, applications, bioimaging and whatnot, and sensors, and of course, the chemistry has really advanced to such a level today that people talk about even Molecular machines, can we really have machines at the molecular level for which even a Nobel Prize went in 2016 for, uh, you know, path-breaking accomplishments and so on and so forth. So any property, uh, any application that you talk of for organic materials, I think as an organic chemist, we can basically dissect it down to three factors to approach any desired property. It's uh, just basically the structure and when you speak of the structure, what actually you have in it built, inbuilt, a functional unit, 
with which you want to elicit the properties that you are looking for. And if you're talking about the materials, then it's about how the molecules come together and make up that bulk. In other words, it's a molecular organization. So three things is the structure, the functional unit that provides us with the kind of uh, property that you're looking for. And if you're talking about the bulk materials and how well are you going to sort of organize. I thought I'll drive home these three points in my own way and take you through uh, our own research as to how, uh, how to approach these problems. My research interests are quite diverse. I work uh, in the area of organic photochemistry. Unfortunately, the, the pointer doesn't work on an LED screen, but organic photochemistry, where we worry about how molecules with you know, photo excitation undergo reactions. And of course, uh, the supramolecular chemistry, how molecules come together, organize themselves, and can we really have a control over them? And if you speak of organic light emitting diodes, as you know, how do you make these materials from first principles? And of course, the catalysis that Dr. Lakshmi Gantam talked about, can we develop? How do we develop, right? So what I'll try to do today is to talk about these three aspects. I'll try to show you how you develop the materials. So I thought I'll take some examples. Photochromic, it's a basically light induced color change. How do you develop these materials? And where are these applications? And the functional porous materials, when you speak of fun porous materials, of course, the life cannot simply move on without having the geolites. Everything started with geolites. But now we have the advanced materials and how is the world looking at? Have we really stayed on with geolites or do we have now more advanced materials with which the same thing can be accomplished in a much better fashion? And of course, porous organic polymers. And what are they? Why do we have to really worry about these are emergent materials? So let me first, uh, these are the three aspects and I'll, I'll dissect that into about 12 to 15 minutes each. Let's look at these photochromic materials. What are these? These are chromism, it's basically color change. Light induced color change of a compound, right? Between two different forms. A chemical substance that's able to sort of oscillate between two different forms with different absorption properties is nothing but photochromism. You have variety of molecules, why do we need them? A simplest application is the ophthalmic lenses that we are aware of. So you get out into the sun and you don't want your high eyes to be hurt and you have basically some kind of a hazardous radiation that is reaching out to the sun, I mean earth. And you would like to pr protect your, your eyes from the ultraviolet radiation and you want to have a screen. And at the same time, you don't want too much light getting into your eyes, be it even visible light and you would like to sort of shield. So you have a compound that absorbs the ultraviolet radiation, turns into colored form. The colored form in, uh, again in return, uh, you know, uh, absorbs the visible light and goes back to the colorless form. There is a cycle set up in the process, the eye can be really protected. The absorbed light is absorbed and dissipated as the heat and eye gets protected, <coughs> which is what we use in ophthalmic lenses. Supposing if you have this chromic compound, which is able to go from one form to the other form, and if the other form doesn't come back quickly, but if you can have a control over that, and you can basically switch at your will, then you are talking about a switch, molecular switch. And if this molecular switch can be, of course, because it is activated with the light, and we have such materials applicable as photonic materials for data storage applications. So what is important is that if you have a photochromic compound that really rapidly shuttles between two forms, then you have a chromism for ophthalmic lens applications. Uh, but if you have a bistability, then you can use them for material applications for data storage applications. So I'll try to show you what are these molecules. I, th I think put it up there, yeah, we have a variety of them. We have for quite some time been concerned with this series. What we call this as basically chromine. And if you don't have that blue ring there, this particular part, if you shine light, goes into a ring open form. And the ring open form, as you can see in organic uh, terms, a compound that with ex, you know, extended conjugation. What we mean by extended conjugation is that the electron can, electrons can move from one place to the other place. Mobility. And when you have that, of course, the compounds become colored. And to begin with, the, the closed form is colorless and you have this colored form. And if you don't have that ring annulation there, it basically goes back so rapidly 
that you cannot even see this process at even about 100 degrees Celsius, minus 100 degrees Celsius. But if you bring about that simple ring annulation, you can see this at room temperature. Color is beautifully red, and red color goes back instantaneously in a few minutes, one to two minutes. We have been working on them for quite some time as to how you can basically regulate, modulate, control, not just the color, but also the persistence. So we speak of spectrokinetic aspects of this photochromism. You know, switching back is very easy, but then acquiring or gaining control over byte stability is not easy because the colored form that you generate is not stable. Often it goes back to the colorless form. Can, if you can gain control over this colored form, then you really have applications for molecular switches. Okay, so there is a review that we wrote on that. We wondered, I think I talked about this one ring, why not we keep adding the rings? And if you keep adding the rings, rings then you can see the structure gets to be helical. And moment we went to about five membered rings there, of course here, moment it is five membered ring, then we began to see a bright coloration. Not only was the color bright, in fact persistent is longer, persistence is longer. But here you have a system where it's a tetrahelical, the persistence is poorer, not only that, in fact the color goes back very quickly, it's not that bright. So which made us, let us increase much more, deal with systems which are penta, I mean hexahelical. The moment you talk about six member rings, this is where for organic chemistry, is really chemistry is exciting. Now there are two ways that you can think about the molecule, where one of them where you have, you have here, you see that oxygen is the interior of the helical axis, and here you see this oxygen is exterior. So two isomers you can have of the same hexa. So this we speak of them as basically regiohelical systems. If, they, if you have two regiohelical systems of the same structure, where oxygen is interior, oxygen is interior, and what do you expect? You, you shine light, I expose the compounds to light, and this is what you expect. In the first instance, of course, this bond should break, and you should have, moment you have that bond breaking and then reorganization of the bond, you get to this species. And in this particular case, because you break bond here, then you end up basically having this, this moiety splayed over the helical scaffold. A consequence of this is this, right? In both forms, basically you get a red color, and the first instance it quickly goes back. In the second instance, it doesn't go back simply doesn't go back. You remember, I talked about this, how to gain control over reversibility. Given that you have destroyed this, you know, kind of structure there, you would like to go back. This particular one is where the aromaticity, aromaticity is lost and you would like to go back. And which is what happens in this first instance. In this case, it doesn't go back. So much so that the colored species persists forever. And in fact, you can do a column topography, isolate the compound, and in fact, get, get hold of the crystals and, and solve the structure. Why does this not go back? The reason is simple. You have built this helicity. Now you opened up this form, and to go back, it has to come into this kind of a form and then cyclize back. And because this diphenyl vinyl moiety is splayed over this helical scaffold, there is this hindrance that is built, and it cannot undergo the bond rotation, so it gets lost. When does it basically come back? Well, you activate the system, give more and more energy, and then you can worry about basically forcing this particular process for cyclization and the color now begins to uh, sort of, you know, revert to colorless form. And take xylene and heat it about 110 degrees and you can see there the color completely goes back and becomes colorless. And as simple as in a, in a chemistry terms, you can basically follow temperature, temperature dependent reversion process and extract kinetic parameters for this. Do it, uh, do it as an arrhenius plot or irings plot and get hold of the enthalpy and the entropic activations for such a process. And it turns out, and here are the numbers. Enthalpy of activation for this process is about 30 kilocalories and, and entropy is about minus one. In other words, you have here a system which, with light becomes colored and comes back to colorless form when you heat it about 110 degrees over a period of about four to five hours. Photochromy, it's a clearly a switch. At room temperature, the colored form is lived for about 53 years. It's a truly a switch. What else can we do? Now, can I pose this question? It's all about molecular, molecules to materials I talked about. 
can I now modulate this structure? What comes back at about 110 degrees? Can I make it come back at 90 degrees? Can I make it come back at 70 degrees? Can I make it come back at 50 degrees? In other words, can I develop a series of molecular materials that revert at graded temperatures? And how do we do that? It's all about the helical scaffold. Can I worry about releasing this helical arc little by little by a molecular design? Which is what we did here, right? We designed a series of molecules and they're all helical. And here are the systems. That is the molecule that I talked about, right? And now let, we let us have the systems like this. So I put a five-membered ring there. I put a five-membered ring here. By putting a five-membered ring even before the helical turn takes off, then you see that the helical scaffold moves away. So hindrance becomes lesser. In fact, as presupposed, all of these molecules are stable when you shine light, colored forms. But the colored forms now go back to colorless forms at a different with the different activation barriers. And this is the activation barrier that we had to begin with, around 30. In this particular system, because you re replace six member ring with a five member ring, it goes back around 28. Because you move the five member ring much closer and the helical arc gets away and it becomes 26 point, you know, two more kilocalories. And this comes back around 60 degrees. You heat it for about four hours. A series of molecules. So what, what is the fun with these molecules? Here is, where, here is the molecular switch. The colored form can be shunted back by heat. In fact, if you have a visible light, you can put it back. On the other hand, if you have a proton here, then you know, protonate this car oxygen here, then reorganize the bonds, it goes back very easily. These are all basically inputs. With inputs and color as the output, you can worry about basically developing a truth table and deduce that for different stimuli or inputs that you have, this particular molecular system typically functions like a logic gate with inhibit function. Molecular logic gate we are talking about. There's one approach. One approach is like basically, you have a system that is opened up but not able to come back because you provided the hindrance. Now, can I have another approach which is the most recent work? You have a system here. Now, I develop the colored form. What if the colored form is more stable than the closed form? Then it would not like to come back. So how do you make the big, you know, initial form more constrained in simple words that it would not like to exist, more destabilized, more unstable when compared to the opened up form and opened up form is generated by light. And which is what we try to do, right? A tryptocene is a very rigid like propeller shaped molecule as you can imagine. So we build this particular pot there. And you open it up, as you can see, here is where you have the system. Then it's a phenyl ring, phenyl rings are basically hitting each other with that particular scaffold. And the system as such, as such is really strained. And you shine light, well, you open it up. And this is what happens. This is the opened up form. Open, opened up form is much more relaxed than the constrained ring and would not like to go back. But whereas when the scaffold is really far away, there is no such issue. It basically comes back and goes, goes and comes back within two minutes. In that particular case, it doesn't go back because opened up form is really, really, really more relaxed. In other words, entropically, the product is more stable. In fact, there's a, one of the rare examples of entropically driven photochromism. And you can basically look at the parameters here and you do the temperature kind of, you know, kind of dependent analysis and come up with entropic factors. When you have a helicene, it's about minus 40.92 or whatever units for the entropy. Enthalpy is only 15. We saw we, the helical system where it was about 30. In fact, any process with about 15 to 16 uh, kilocalories of enthalpy of activation should occur very easily at room temperature. If it is not for something else, and the something else here is the entropic factor. This is just to show you how you can basically sort of, you know, develop materials at your will. That is about photochromism. Let, let me now switch gears and go to the second topic, porous materials. Porous materials, of course, variety of applications, and that's why they're, they're so important, and starting from zeolites. These, these, are the, these are the materials that have become very important in the last few or two decades, I would say. It's a metal organic framework structures. It's all a simple joy or, or fun. If you have spaces and if you have nodes and you can just mix them, if you have a basically a metal node with, with let's say kind of a trigonal geometry, 
and you can basically take an organic linker with a trigonal geometry, you can get to two dimensional honeycomb structure. If you have a metal linker that gives you a tetrahedral connectivity of this kind, right, and you can have a metal organic spacer with tetrahedral, you can get to a diamondoid structure. This is a work that has been pioneered by Yagi. Of course, it's like a Tinker Toy set. You can, you can deal with the metals as a nodes and organic uh, structures as spaces and, and, and weave materials, metal organic materials. And this work was pioneered by Yagi and who showed that by dealing with the different organic spaces, by using metal ions, you can construct porous materials at your will and they have come to be popularly called as metal organic framework structures. And we have been working on this for quite some time. In fact, we were ours is the first group to have gotten into these materials. And starting off with the first paper there in Angavan Academy in 2005. So there's a lot of work, but I'll try to show you one example of how to build materials, porous materials, starting from molecules, right? So let me take this particular case. Pyrene, right? Is a flat molecule, like it's tabletop. But Pyrenes stack each other in the solid state. And then when there is a stacking, it's a brilliantly fluorescent material, but there is a concept called as a self-quenching. And you shine light, the fluorescence is quenched and you don't have the fluorescence. But what you can do is, the, the quenching happens because of the stacking. So we can, we can worry about preventing the stacking. And here you have a tabletop, I can do the paneling. So if I have a panel here at the four corners, like rigid panels, then molecules cannot come together. And in doing so, what also you do is, like for example here, you build a concavity, concavity, concavity. Even on the flat base, because now there are panels basically stick up and down, you have a lot of space that is created. So molecule is inherently, you know, porous. It, it inherently features some kind of concave shapes. Such a molecule, I hook up here a lactic acid moiety, O, C, O, C, O, C, O, O, H with methyl there, R1, R1. It's a lactic acid, plentifully available from nature, cheap, a chiral molecule. So it's a molecule, a flat molecule, a fluorescent molecule at the four corners decked up with some kind of a sticky sides. I want to call them as a sticky sides because they're carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids you treat with metal, they form metal carboxylate. In other words, I'm talking about metal mediated molecular assembly of a molecule that inherently features some kind of concave shapes. So you have at the periphery the sticky sites. So the sticky sites, you metallate them and propagate them. And if you do that, this is what happens. So this is the molecular structure and such a molecule you weave with metal, then you get to a material, porous material. The porosity comes as a consequence of the concavity that you have built in it. And this material, the porous material that you have built, because your building block is chiral by virtue of the lactic acid, the entire material is a homochiral. In other words, you're talking about a porous material that typically is like an enzyme, which has, it has chirality built into its, its, its chiral pockets, voids. So it should function like an enzyme. If that is the case, and given that the pyrene is a flat molecule that is fluorescent, can we use this for signaling whatever that goes into the port as a sensory material, right? And not get delve into the details, they just to show you it's a brilliantly fluorescent because self quenching is hindered by having paneling. And you can worry about the CD spectra. And there is some intuition with which we build and demonstrate the fact that you can have, we have 20 plus natural amino acids, all are L. And it turns out that of the 20 amino acids, only one amino acid is selectively sensed by this material. So take this dispersion of this material and put in all amino acids, the fluorescence is not disturbed, but except with one amino acid that is histidine. Why it is, is something that we can talk about outside, but just suffi suffice it to say that you have built a material which typically functions like an enzyme, which selectively captures only histidine and senses if histidine is there or not by, by kind of a, you know, a diminution a a in terms of the fluorescence intensity that you're seeing. Not only is the D, or L, of course, when you speak of the histidine, you have DRL, isomers, and which of them, because I said that, you know, the material is homochiral, can we differentiate between the D and L? In fact, you can differentiate between the D and L, with L being basically sort of uh, sensed poorly when compared to D, if you look at basically the Sarnomar constants. That is about 3D. I just want to give a glimpse into how you build basically materials based on molecules. Now, 2D materials have become very, very, very popular post 
the Nobel Prize in 2010 to Andre Game and Nobel Celeb. And people have been wondering about, can we really make graphene equivalents of organics? Can we have organic equivalents or inorganic equivalents? So there are plenty of them in the inorganic realm. You can worry about, you know, in fact, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Kantham again talked about a few uh, layered dihydroxides and, you know, boron nitrides and metals and magazines and, you know, transition metal, metal dichalcogenides and whatnot. You have a big series of them. But there is a problem with these inorganic materials. You cannot deal with them. You cannot, you cannot functionalize. You have to accept whatever properties that they come with. But the beauty with organic is because you build from bottom up way, from molecules, you can play with them. And that is the beauty with the organic systems. You have a function, control over functional chemistry. Right? And I'll try to show you how we do that. How do you develop 2D, you know, organic nano sheets or metal organic nano sheets, for example? Can we do this? If you want to do this, what has come to be known is that in the literature, if you have a layered material, absolutely layered material, put this layered material into an organic solvent and do an ultrasonication, the solvent molecules sneak in between the layers and the layers can be sort of separated out and the layers now get stabilized with the solvent molecules and there is a mechanism. Ultrasonication is the way provided if you have layered material. But how do you get to the layered material in a way that you want from organic molecules? It's not easy. But then if you, you can, that's where the joy is. You can build some kind of a function into the, uh, functions into the molecules, dictate the molecules to undergo assembly only in two dimensions. So if a molecule is programmed to assemble only in two dimensions, and if you can get to a layer, such layers to stack up, the material that you get is a layered material. Once you have a layered material, again go back, put it into a solvent, ultrasonicate it, you can generate this. I'll try to show you how we do this, right? The same approach. I take this tetracarboxylic acid. And also not only that we generate basically 2D materials and we have want to operate at a higher level. Can we do chemistry on them? Chemistry on these 2D materials, right? Now, I take this dihydroxy tetracarboxylic acid. Now, because the hydroxy groups are at ortho position, very proximately placed, now they cannot be planar, they're twisted. And because they're twisted, with respect to the central ring here, now the propagation in the direction perpendicular to the plane is very difficult. Now you do put a metal, this carboxylic acid undergo basically metallation, and you get to a 2D nano sheet. And again, because there is a concavity in between the two rings, and there is a concavity in here, and you can see the porous porosity here. You're talking about porous 2D material. And if you have a poor porous 2D material, of course, what you get hold of is a material where the layers are stuck to each other. Now we want to liberate these layers. And I told you, right, liberation can be done by ultrasonication. UILPE, ultrasonication induced liquid phase exfoliation. But you ought to have the 2D material. And you get to 2D material, and of course, that's how the macroscopic it looks like. Now, and if you look at the structure as determined by X-ray crystallography, you can see the porosity. Now, because I have the porosity, I can worry about even doing the chemistry on them. Now, I show you the redox chemistry. If you have a hydroquinone, easy it is, you basically sort of oxidize, put an oxidant, and two hydrogens you take away and reorganize the structure, you get a quinone, quinone is yellow. And of course, reduce it back, you should be able to go back. All that you can do, just the layers extracted into a solution, and this is the 2D material that you have. Basically, put an oxidant, you get to yellow color. Put a reductant and you go back. In fact, you can worry about these 2D materials being likewise switched electrochemically. Electrochemical redox process. You can in principle do it, right? And, okay, some more, right? You can build such materials. Again, the same concept, a porous material, and the porous material, of course, can be characterized by all kinds of microscopic techniques, and here I show. And moment you start liberating them as a 2D materials, in fact, the fluorescence comes off. Otherwise, in the condensed phase, the fluorescence is quenched. Now I can use this material as a sensory material for sensing nerve agents. Like, for example, tub in sarin, soman, and whatnot, but you don't want to deal with them, and we all know the toxicological effects of this, right? There are a variety of ways to sense them, but we deal with what are called as a mimics, and you, here you have di uh, CP is a chloro uh, uh, diethyl phosphonate and DACP, and these are all basically the mimics of the nerve agents. Now I show you that this dispersion of 2D material, can, which is brilliantly fluorescent, can be used for sensing this in about 0.5 ppm levels. 
the 2D materials for sensing application. I can go further, yet another material, of course, for sensing dihydrogen phosphate anions selectively. But I want to demonstrate a chemistry of much higher level. Can I develop basically 2D materials that respond to light and they're basically sort of, you know, photochemically operate, operable? How do we do that? And this is the reaction that I told you uh, when I began my talk. Now, can I basically incorporate in my organic linko and develop a 2D metal organic nanosheet and which responds to light? So the, you have a 2D man nanosheet, metal organic nanosheet, that with light becomes colored and goes back. Can I have a basically 2D material that is photo, photo responsive functional material? Now, here I do, I want to sort of, sort of show you, this is a basically joy of an organic chemist, how you deal with molecules and how the materials basically that macroscopically respond to your, you know, microscopic insights or input, right? And here is the process that I talked about. When you shine light, there is a basically a structure, volume demanding process. Photochemically, you open up this bond and the species, colored species becomes a volume demanding process. So that is taken care of in the molecular design. Let me draw your attention to this molecule. If you open up that particular bond, because you have built this kind of an arms, and that particular ring then opens up, there is a concavity. Within the concavity, the volume demand is taken care of in the molecular design. Now it's about, I have an organic linker, treat with metal ions, and develop metal organic materials, and metal organic materials that you get are all porous, and you see here, this is where you have photochrome, and you shine light, there is a lot of space here for this process to operate, right? And it's a completely 2D. Why is it 2D? How can you dictate this? Because if you look at this particular carbon here, you have one phenyl ring coming towards you, one phenyl ring going towards the board, a screen. So you have this uh, kind of a material like this with phenyl ring, phenyl ring in a flat system, sticking backside and front side. Now, you put metal, metal assembles only in this direction because another molecule to come in this direction, there's a hindrance, the blockade. So, you basically dictate the molecule to assemble only in two dimensions, and which is exactly what you see in the crystal structures everywhere. Even if you want to get to three-dimensional structure, you don't get here because of the hindrance that is built. So, a variety of materials, not just one. So, all these materials, if you look at layers, and this is how the layers are, and because of this phenyl rings stick each other, and they are compactly packed. There is no space. But if you liberate them, you will have the space. So this is what we expect, right? We expect that the layers, you put it into the solvent, ultrasonic it, you get this material, and this should show photochromism because you have built a photochrome into this 2D material, right? <coughs> so this is the material it looks. In fact, in the solid phase, you don't ultrasonic it, and you get the layers there, and you can see yellow colored solution becomes brilliantly green, and this color goes back very nicely. You can follow basically decay of the absorption with time, and extract basically rate constant for reversion. This operates in about two of two minutes. And how do you know they are basically two dimensional metal organic nanosheets? And of course, Tyndall effect is one of them, and you can go after all kinds of you know experiments like involving microscopy to show that they are basically two D metal organic nanosheets and show that, you know, ultrasonication doesn't destroy metal ligand bonds, all kinds of XPS and everything you can do. And if you allow the material to come back again, reforms it, and you have X-ray crystallographic signature. Now, can I take it to the proof of concept? You have a molecular material with which you built a 2D material, and 2D material is photoresponsive, but I want to use it for ophthalmic lenses, right? And normally, organic compound, you put it into polymer, it'll come off. It'll come out, it'll leach out. But because now you have a 2D polymeric material and which gets impregnated into the polymeric matrix of the glass that you make, polymethyl methacrylate, and it's interwoven, there's no leaching issue. That is the beauty of the 2D materials, polymeric material. Now, I, want to, I don't want to show it with the PMMA, but there is something called as a, you know, organically modified silica gel. And I take this kind of a triethoxysilane and uh, ethyl triethoxysilane, and by hydrolysis, you can basically make a sol. When the sol state, you basically put in this 2D material dispersion. Now, the polymer-polymer intermixing happens, and of course, you can basically put it on a slide. And do you elicit this property on the slide? And here it is, and I take ID, ID compo that's supposed to be pale yellow because of the projection issue. And now it is green, shine light, it becomes green and goes back. And you can basically oscillate between this screen, you know, the colors multiple times. 
This is basically from molecules to materials of how you create 2D materials that respond to your call. That's about the second aspect. And the third is, I said new emergent materials. I have, right? 9.30 is my, 10.30 is my time. I do have enough time. Yeah, we have, we have limited amount of time. Yeah, but I'll, I'll take my time, <laughs> right? No, no, I'll not take time. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I'll, I'll finish in about five minutes, yeah. So we catalytic materials, right? Now, here it is. When you try speak of the porous materials, everything has originated from zeolites. And I talk about basically metal organic framework structures and then have come basically into picture, covalent organic frameworks, COPs. And then we are talking about porous organic polymers, porous molecular solids, so let's not talk about that. These are new emergent materials. And if you see this, you see, they are basically completely, no metal ions, in organic compounds that are basically generated as porous by, by covalent bonding. Because it's a covalent bonding, you cannot meddle with it, they're robust. And rapidly growing in number, diverse chemistry, commercial applications are enormous for these materials. How do you tell a molecule? Of course, you polymers, you make starting from molecules. How do you tell a molecule? Hey, guys, polymerize only in one particular way that I want. And in doing so, leave a lot of space for me. Can you tell the molecule? No. But then you can dictate, you can program the molecules to sort of deliver us the property that we look for. And it's, no, it's come to be known in the literature. And I showed you how we can do this with metal organic framework structures. There we demonstrated this by using metallization. But here, we want to do it by covalent polymerization. So in other words, we use organic reactions for setting up polymerization processes. Here it is, for example, one, one such process is if you have a terminal acetylene, cyclotrimerization we can be done with cobalt and people have tried to sort of develop such polymers. Just to give you literature examples. So I was intrigued by this. There's something called a palladium DBA, scarps metal, and getting depleted is Im immensely, in fact, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Kantham talked about it, right, palladium, using palladium. In fact, she talked about a few reactions that she has taken it to even the industrial scale. And here it is one. It's used, but then discarded. We cannot basically afford losing out the transition metals that are very precious. Can we worry about recyclability? Can we worry about basically doing the reactions in a heterogeneous fashion, in a recyclable way? That's when we, worry, we, we, we can talk about sustainability, which is a very important contemporary theme everywhere, given in our living, if you have to worry about the future generations. Now, she also talked about this reaction, if you paid attention to, right? The lithium di you know, uh, uh, dihydroxide, lead dihydroxide, when she talked about Kleisen-Schmidt reaction, cross aldol condensation. You have a uh, ketone and you have an aldehyde, put a little bit of base, and then you get to aldol condensation, which is started with 10 plus 2 level. Right? If I go back here, which is exactly what you have. A palladium here is bound by what is called as an enone moiety. This enone moiety can be had from aldol condensation, kleisen schmidt condensation. If that is the case, we wondered, why not we use this simple reaction? Make a polymer which has n number of such enone functionality and put in palladium and see if palladium can be stabilized by these enone bonds. If palladium can be st stabilized by the such a polymer, then palladium stabilized polymer should be possible to be used as equivalent of palladium DBA that I showed. And that is a simple concept. And here is our, our strategy. Our strategy is simple. If you have a molecule that features inherently concave shape, and here is where your polymerization is, and you link up molecules, then there is a cavity that you should develop by the very nature of way that you direct polymerization. Right? And here are the systems. Do we see that? Yes. You take a molecule like that and, and worry about basically polymerization. I think I showed you the molecules here. These are the molecules that you take, right? Acetyl, 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 and put a terephthalaldehyde. You basically create polymers everywhere pores. And you have a lot of these enone functionalities. Now you get a polymer. Is a polymer that you get really porous, fantastically porous. Now you can use this material and take palladium acetate and reduce it with sodium borohydrate, develop this palladium zero in this matrix, and palladium should get absorbed by whatever interactions that I told you. If so, can we use this in a recyclable fashion for lots of chemical transformations? Here I showed. I think she, ta she also talked about nitro arranged to anilines. You can do that by putting a balloon, putting this material in a recyclable fashion, filter it, clean process, 
you can do kind of a hydrogenation of molyphens. You can do the coupling that she also talked about, Suzuki coupling by using palladium in a, in a recyclable fashion. And of course, even the cascade transformations you can do. Let me take it further. It's again a simple concept. If you have a molecule that is highly disorganized, not organized, twisted, you polymerize, you get a polymeric chain. Because the building blocks are very, very twisted, now you try to bring these polymeric chains together. No matter how you try to pack them, they're bound to be voids because the building blocks are twisted. And that is the concept basically. It's like saying that if I have cubical boxes here, if I'm asked to pack up in this hall, I would pack up very nicely without any void. But if I'm asked to basically cut up all the branches from the trees outside, I pack it as much as possible. No matter how much I try, I will leave open everywhere pore because packing is not possible. So disorder is the source of basically the porosity because polymeric chains that are so disorganized cannot be packed efficiently. And that's what happens here. So take a very twisted molecular building block and if you have biphenyl like this, at ortho positions, methyl and methoxy, you twist it up, the molecule is inherently twisted and now you polymerize and such a material is, is inherently porous. Now on this material, I can do a simple chlorosulfonation and introduce sulfonic acid. It's a basically Lewis acid. I have a polymer. I don't need to use a N number of chemical transformations that you do with acid catalyst. Now I have an acid, a very strong acid and as part of the polymer that, that, is, is, that isn't insoluble. I can do, put it, it, put it into the reaction medium as an insoluble material. Does it does its uh, purpose because, because, there are, because of the pores inside, the reactants can go in and out. Material transport is easy and the reactants can access this Lewis acid sites. The transformation should occur. How porous are they? Just to show you, in fact, these numbers are small in my polymer. It's only about 700 whatever uh, square meters per gram if you do the bead analysis. There are organic polymers likewise known with the 3,000 to 4,000 square meters per gram. You can engineer such a porosity. Now here, they are meant for some kind of a transformation. Just to show you, work brilliantly. There is one such reaction what is called as a cyclocondensation. You can build this kind of a photoreactive molecules, chromines, by this reaction by using in a recyclable fashion the catalyst. You can have a nitrostyrenes, uh, you can do dipolar cycloadditions to generate what are called as a triazole molecules just to show you how you can accomplish this. We can play around, take the twisted molecules like that, treat with a simple pyridine, you get basically a salt and we speak of the phase transfer reagents in organic transformations where the organic compounds can be brought into a different phase and reactions can be facilitated. You can develop a polymer of that kind and of course I'll not get into that details where such a kind of material functions not only as a phase transfer trans catalyst but also as a you know kind of an activator where you have this kind of a electron deficient system by CO pi interactions basically sort of activates this particular carbonyl towards a nucleophilic attack and you can do the Michael addition reactions very conveniently at room temperature. And of course this is just to show you such reactions can be performed very nicely in a recyclable fashion and even condensations can be done. These are the recent works that I have. And I, with that, I must conclude. I think you know there are a lot of students that have worked to contributing the research that I talked about. I give a glimpse into what we have, what we, the kind of fun that we have uh, in our research. Of course, has been generously supported by, uh, uh, of course, as a, um, given as a JC Bose Fellowship Fellow uh, of SCRB and DST formerly. And of course, I'm grateful to my institution, the IIT Kanpur, the glorious institution that I come from for the past, where I have been for the past 23, 24 years. And now I moved to this institution about three and a half years back and it was in a primitive stage and it just had been sort of a, all the operations had moved. I should use this forum to advertise this place because IIT Kanpur is well known. I don't need to talk about it, right? But there's an emerging institution. As a head of the institution, I think I, I feel obliged and uh, feel responsible to sort of showcase to you, uh, well, there is this institution which is on the horizon and I, I, I've been striving hard to make this one of the one of the great institutions to showcase to the country as to how it can be, right? A, a beautiful place, a beautiful institution. There's just a, a few pictures of the institution, uh, very picturesque, and uh, you know we want to we want to make this one nothing equivalent than a European university that you see outside. We go around, we speak of only the private institutions as being great. Why can't we have a government-run institution? Nothing less. 
is the aim with which we have been functioning. I think it does showcase the way that I talk about. It's, it's a beautiful campus. I invite all of you to come over and, and stay in our retreat, we, what we call as a you know, visitor's forest retreat uh, in Aysatirunandapur. That is for you to sort of, you know, kind of savor uh, the beautiful campus. With that, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes for taking questions. Yeah. Yes, Vita. Very, very interesting work. Actually, I felt that you done such a work that you allowed molecules to bend on your order. <laughs> so I just you like have to have passion. Sorry. Yeah, your passion, your order. So I just want to know: Have you ever come across any such molecule? You felt it is it would be very interesting, but you couldn't make it. See, research is such, of course, you know, you always have <laughs> so some failures. And when we come for a talk like this, we only talk about what we, where we have research. Of course, there are, you know, I can sit across with you and talk about <laughs> a few it. that that we have not seen light of. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, Thank you, I Professor just, uh, I just want to ask you whether you have thought, of, see, you talked about luminescent materials mm -hmm. mainly. Have you thought about making some magnetic materials as well? Yes, I, in fact, if somebody can help me, we do have, you know, say I'm an organic chemist, I'm a photochemist, <laughs> I'm a supramolecular chemist, synthetic chemist, and there's a limitation, right? If you keep going into materials, materials, there are a variety of them, for example, even from organic transistors, for example, field effect, uh, tra trans FET materials. And organic light emitting diodes is something that I did not talk about, which we worked quite a bit on, and, and I, I told you. We do have magnetism, but I'm not an expert of that. Moreover, you know, we have we have a few polymers that we wanted to look at, and you look you look for squid, and squid is up you know working only in few institutions. There is a beehive of line Q, and I had to at some point in time say no, I'll not get into this domain because I don't I lack that expertise. Also, yeah. which is where the question comes into. Right? There is one aspect that no, I could not go forward. So, uh, also, another thing that I was thinking of was you know the what are called photonic band gap materials. Mm. Okay, whether you can make such materials. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, using, uh, you know, organic... Uh, uh, we can, because uh, LEDs are also the same, right? It's about band gap. No, no. Uh, In a way. Pho photonic band gap materials will prevent, you know, light of certain wavelengths to go through the material I mean, I mean in, I mean in any direction. I mean, I mean gone into okay. I mean gone so into maybe, you know, it, it may be interesting. Like, for example, even NIR materials also, we can stretch, right? But there's a limitation that comes into picture. You know, you go and they become jack of all, man of none, and, you know. Yeah, since you did not... Expose uh, any limitations, I'm asking. Oh, very positive, very positive, <laughs> very positive. Uh, uh, it should be positive. Only thing is, uh, it's all basically absorbing the concepts of that and worrying about how you can build that feature. So yeah. Any other question? There is. One more, yeah. Very nice lecture. Um, porous materials normally uh, are uh, fragile also because of the uh, so no. no no if you're talking about MOFs yes huh. they're hydrolytically stable yeah. but if you're talking about the emergent materials that I yes. talked about yeah. POFs yeah. porous organic polymers they're covalently bound even in MOFs also there are zirconium carboxylates that people talk about which have been proven to be more hydrolytically stable it's not so fragility in, in terms of basic mechanical the stability. Strength. Yeah. mechanical strength mechanical I was strength. talking about but organic no these are soft materials, absolutely stable. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other question? Yeah. Yeah. If not, then let me thank Professor Murthy. Thank you. Thank you. A thank wonderful you. lecture. Thank how you. to design materials from molecules by really clever chemistry. So thank you, Professor Murthy, for an excellent lecture. Yeah. And we also thank the chair of the session, uh, Professor Sadopal a distinguished chemist and who was director of NCL and also of ICER. I will thank you, sir, for beautifully thank conducting you. this session. I thank Insa and Devang for inviting me to chair this session. Thank you. And there is a small announcement. Immediately after the session, there is going to be a group photograph uh, just outside. So before proceeding for tea, please just stay back and uh, have a group photograph taken.